my name is Dr. G. Welcome to That's Unusual, my podcast uncovering the unusual stories behind the world's most interesting people. On this show, we celebrate what makes us different and how we convert those differences into unexpected opportunities. Welcome to That's Unusual. If you're enjoying these episodes, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, and leave me a review. That helps me better understand if you're enjoying these shows and certainly keeps me motivated to produce more for you. My guest today is Dave Chase, a serial entrepreneur termed film producer. He's a highly sought after speaker, author, investor, who has been named one of the most influential people in digital health. Dave is a leading voice for positive change in healthcare, having sold his prior company, Avado, to WebMD, and now founding the Health Rosetta to help certify quality standards across the industry. His views, passions, and ideas are now culminating in his latest film project, The Big Heist, a satirical follow-the-money film on the destruction from healthcare status quo and the coming redemption. More than a movie, it is a movement designed to affect change from the bottom up. As you listen to this episode, I ask that you reflect on your own unusual stories and unique qualities that can help open doors to unexpected opportunities. And so with that, let's get started. Welcome to That's Unusual. I'm really excited about today's show. We've got uh, Dave Chase with us here today. Um, Hi there, Dave. Hi, Dr. G. How you doing? I'm doing wonderful, thanks. So excited to have this conversation because you are just a fascinating character. You've got, uh, you know, you're a serial entrepreneur, you're a speaker, you're an author, and now, uh, you know, you've got sort of this latest role as being a film producer, which is really, really cool and an area that I'm fascinated about. And I want to just really jump right in here and talk about The Big Heist, which is your biggest and latest project, and it's very ambitious. Why don't, uh, in your words, tell us about the big heist and what was sort of the impetus behind, you know, going and creating this effort? Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, the backdrop was, you know, when I was getting my last startup going, you know, a tech startup is basically a bet on how the future is going to unfold and get it a little ahead of time. And so I went looking for a market gap. And what I found, I believe, is the greatest heist in American history. And the more I dug in, the more I realized people don't realize the magnitude of the damage that's being done to America. And so as I thought about, gosh, the healthcare is, has this huge contrast between, on the one hand, this very wasteful, dysfunctional system that really seemingly everybody is you know unhappy with, including the doctors and nurses. On the other hand, you have, in my belief, all of the structural fixes have been invented, proven, and scaled modestly, but are still the exception of the rule, you know, everybody would want that if they knew about it. And so I kind of joked, it's just a marketing problem, because of course, everybody would want that. And Mm -hmm. as I thought about, gosh, how do you deal with that challenge? And I thought back to the huge movements that we've had in our society. And you look at all the big problems that I could think of in the last 100 years, you know, as women's voting rights, civil rights, you know, better, safer food, and so on. They all got fixed bottoms up. And if you look at these movements, they were catalyzed by media and film. In MLK's day, it was, you know, the evening news and the morning newspaper. And I realized, gosh, healthcare has really not had that sort of film. Probably the closest thing was Michael Moore's Sicko, which was 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But A, that was 10 years ago. B, you know, the reality is half the country won't listen to Michael Moore. And so we thought, gosh, we need to take a fiercely nonpartisan approach and in a wickedly funny, raucously entertaining way, wake people up and let them know what's going on. And so that kind of one thing led to another. I was hoping somebody else would run with that idea because I didn't know anything about making films. But as I got into it, people were like, you should just run with it. And, you know, <laughs> this is just like another startup. And I'm like, okay, you know, yeah, I'll well, do it. Somebody, somebody's got to do it. Yeah. Why not you? Exactly. So, I mean, interesting that you call it the heist. I mean, do you, do you think that as a society, we're actually being fooled into thinking we've got one system when, in fact, it's being designed and preserved to be another way? I mean, do you think it's... You know, there's this series of challenges or problems, 
you know, facing healthcare that just on the surface are cost, quality, and so forth? Or do you really think that there's a system and a heist going on here that's trying to preserve an old system? Well, I mean, at some level, we've all been a part of this, including myself. I mean, the start of my career was doing what we call revenue cycle management, you know, kind of how do you optimize revenues inside of a hospital? And I don't think people are kind of rubbing their hands together, you know, like an evildoer, but collectively it adds up. And you look at the impact on the middle class and the fact that, you know, one definition of economic depression is two or more years of income decline. By that definition, the middle class has been in a 20 year long economic depression. That's longer than the Great Depression. And yeah, there are things that people have one set of beliefs that are really a polar opposite from reality. A good example of that are PPO networks. We think that you need to rent a PPO network because we would think that a whoever's managing that PPO network would have more buying power than us and therefore it ought to be a better deal. In reality, companies pay for the, you know, typically 15 to 20 dollars or maybe 12 to 20 dollars per employee per month to access these networks that give you the privilege of overpaying by at least 50%, in many cases, literally paying two, three, even 10 times as much as what's appropriate. Whether you call that a heist or not, it is having a big impact. And if you look at this economic depression that we're in, it's not because employers aren't spending more money. They are spending far more money than they were 20 years ago. The problem is every dollar and then some has gone to healthcare. And it's not like our lives have, you know, been extended twofold or something like that. You look at that and then more recently, I mean, there are some literal heists going on that are really jaw-dropping in terms of fraud from foreign actors who basically see that you know, the bank vault's kind of been left open because there's very little motivation to stop fraud by the, you know, insurance companies who administer the claims for large companies. And so there was a whole bit in The Economist about this. I think they called it the $272 billion swindle. And it was pointing out how foreign actors see the easy pickings here. So stuff that's clearly fraudulent. And if there was a motivation to catch it, it could be caught. But the reality is, Anything that provides upward premium pressure is good for insurance companies because you know they're increasingly getting paid a percentage of the denominator, you know, with the medical loss mm-hmm. ratio and other plans. So these things are going on. Most of them are, are legal, uh, technically, but then there are actually some you know criminal activity that you know I've learned about more recently. I just want to probe into a couple of words that you sort of highlighted in your description of the big heist, you know, one of them being movement. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, what in sort of your ideal world, I mean, how do you see a movement essentially coming about as a result of the big heist that things like sicko and supersize me were not able to accomplish? I mean, how do you see that playing out? Yeah, great question. I see it playing out in some analogous ways to what happened with civil rights and green building, where we're setting up an institute, we're calling the Health Rosetta Institute, that is basically focused in on education, certification, and evangelization. So I think of it as kind of a healthcare mashup of LEED certification, which accelerated green building, fair trade, which you may have heard about with coffee, Mm -hmm the Southern Christian Leadership Conference and the Highland School, the latter two were integral in the civil rights movement. Without that sort of grassroots movement that's broad-based and healthcare is very local, so it's got to happen at the local level, I just don't think the change can happen. If you look at things like green building and climate change, you know, the cities and counties climate declaration, you know, that started in Seattle slash King County, which is a Mm -hmm. county where Seattle is. And it grew bit by bit. Eventually, Bloomberg came on board. And then ultimately, a thousand cities really forced the hand of the national governments. And that's ultimately what led to the Paris Climate Accord and what led to you know China and the US recently signing that. And so it's a long-term deal. You know, one movie can just be a spark, but sparks matter. 
And so that's how we think about it in terms of the movement. You know, I love this idea of, you know, creating some sort of certification through the Health Rosetta to hold people essentially accountable in terms of, you know, how they're essentially playing into the movement and addressing the change as we go forward. Take us back. I mean, the whole green movement, you know, is now a couple decades old, but I'd imagine had very similar challenges in sort of getting off the ground. Healthcare is a little bit of a different breed in, in the sense that, you know, you might be able to get organizations to effectively change. But I mean, do you see consumers themselves taking a little bit more ownership in terms of, you know, how they see themselves playing a role in this massive movement versus just the innovators and the organizations that are made up of the system? I think it's both. And so the reality is in healthcare, things are still driven heavily at the organizational level, particularly employees, employers, I should say. If you look at most Americans, they get their health care benefits through work. And so the first certification that we're working on is around benefits professionals. You know, we want to make heroes out of the early adopters there. And if you look at the green building movement, as you said, 20 years ago, fringe concept, 10 years ago, you know, having a lead certified building was a marketing advantage for a developer. Today, it's basically table stakes. We're going to focus in on the benefits professionals and the benefits packages. And then where the individuals come in is, I think one of the, it's not limited to them, but I think a pivotal group will be millennials. They are the Mm -hmm. largest generation in history. The oldest millennials are leaving the invincible stage. So they're starting to pay attention to healthcare where, Mm -hmm. you know, they didn't just like most of us didn't at that age. They get things like lead and fair trade and the fact is healthcare as it's designed today is designed perfectly as a polar opposite to what they want and value. They will be made aware of this in part by the film. I mean, one of the just staggering things that if it wasn't well sourced, I'd have a hard time believing it was there's a great book called Catastrophic Care written by David Goldhill. And he breaks down a millennial he calls Becky and what she's earning today and you know a reasonable set of assumptions as to how her income would grow and out of the her 3.8 million lifetime earnings 1.9 million of that will go to healthcare and that assumes that healthcare growth is only half of what CMS projects you know the center for medicare and medicaid services mm-hmm. and, and they've never you know underestimated the growth in the past so that's i think she pretty conservative things. It grows at the rate they project, it would actually be about three quarters of lifetime earnings. Now, some of that she sees, you know, because it's her portion of the premium. A lot of it is what her employer is paying and then a bunch of its taxes. It all adds up to just a staggering amount that dwarfs any college debt concerns they have. And so I think as people see that, they will then say, I'm going to go to work for a company that's Health Rosetta certified, you know, and I'm going to look for these things because that's every bit as important as my compensation package. So, you know, you don't, you know, get those things out overnight any more than lead happened overnight, but bit by bit, you know, I think of it as sort of spot fires that you're starting in different geographies, different companies, and this is already happening. I mean, there's companies spending 20 to 55% less per capita with better benefits packages than 99% of the workforce. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's totally affordable if we do it right. You know, another phrase that you had raised earlier in our discussion was the fact that this is going to be nonpartisan. Of course, there's, given the elections occurring right now, and there's a lot of debate between what, you know, from the left or right side, you know, how our healthcare system should effectively be designed. Is this going to take any stance in terms of looking at the dynamics of the Affordable Care Act, you know, looking at single payer system versus, you know, the fee for service system that we're currently in is going to be looking at the performance based value driven accountable care organizations. And how are you going to take a very nonpartisan position in terms of describing what this heist is and how we get involved to change it? Yeah, good question. You know, if you if you look at, you know, what's the best way to protect the status quo of anything, you politicize it. And so there's nothing better than healthcare at being able to be politicized. And, you know, the thing that's interesting is I've been on this seven year quest to find all these folks who've figured it out. The interesting thing is the ideas that you'd probably call bleeding heart liberal are being implemented by staunch conservatives. And then there's 
ideas that are supposedly conservative that former Democratic Party hacks that are now overseeing HR are doing. The reality is whether you're talking about private or you know our flavor of single payer Medicare, top to bottom we purchase healthcare really poorly in this country, including Medicare. I believe the two biggest problems are pricing failure and overtreatment, and Medicare really hasn't solved those well. And so we just want to put out there: this is actually what's working. I don't care what your political persuasion is, mm-hmm. whether you do single payer, you know, whether you do a universal health care system that is employer-based, whatever. I mean, part of it is if you have all these solutions that are incredibly affordable, people aren't as afraid of universal health care, which doesn't mean single payer. I mean, there's plenty of countries that have private systems but have a universal requirement. So let's, you know, maybe it'll be a de facto universal, but it's understandable why people are concerned about universal health care because they think, oh, that's just going to further accelerate the bankrupting of the country. Mm-hmm. As I said, each of these solutions, they really don't have a partisan bent to it. And if you look at things like a good example is, you know, which is one piece of the puzzle is proper primary care. Well, there was a bipartisan bill put up by Senator Bill. He's now Senator Bill Cassidy, but when he was in the House with now Governor Jay Inslee of the state of Washington, when they were both in the House, they put something up. And even though, you know, now Senator Bill Cassidy was very much an opponent of Obamacare, you know, he found common ground. And there's these areas that you find common ground on, and they're the focus. And and actually, he has a bill that he, that's the most wacky name bill ever. The world's greatest health plan <laughs> is the name of the bill. But it's actually a pretty good, you know, plan from what I can, you know, my quick read of it. And it's interesting because it justifiably points out some shortcomings of the ACA. And I think the basis for compromise is, you know, if you're a Democrat, you could say, look, we got the Republicans to accept this is the law of the land. We knew any big piece of legislation was going to need to be fixed and now they're fixing it. And, you know, they can go and make that happen. And conversely, a Republican could say, look, Obamacare had all these flaws and he laid out 25 areas that need to be improved. We got our ideas through there and, and you know, that's good. And we we fixed Obamacare. So they can both take credit and both claim a win. And I, I get that that's, you know, an optimistic, you know, view of that. But I think it's possible with, with good right-minded folks. Is this film going to be something that's U.S. centric for the most part? Or are you going to be drawing in any examples that have occurred sort of on the global platform? I'd say the first piece will be pretty U.S. centric. The solutions aren't U.S. centric, but I think that uh, it doesn't mean that it won't be entertaining for an international audience because what's better than to laugh at Americans and some of the crazy stuff? that we do in terms of ways to waste money. But, you know, there's only so much we can take in on the first film. We would like it to ultimately have enough success that it becomes, you know, a series, whether it's a Netflix or HBO or web series or whatever. And as I said, a lot of these problems aren't US specific. We're just, you know, the poster child of how to waste money faster than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about, you also raised the fact that this film project you think is going to be more effective by taking more of a a satire based approach in terms of the production and direction of it why do you think that that is an important or critical piece in terms of getting the message across for this film project yeah the reality is very you know you or i may want to watch a great pbs documentary but the average joe doesn't watch those and so our first bar that you know we're going to do everything we can to clear is have it be just wickedly funny and use that as, you know, a Trojan horse of sorts to like go in and, you know, fully entertain so that anybody would want to watch it and then kind of step back and go, whoa, you know, what is going on here? And get them to basically take a pause and realize that, oh, there's a real dichotomy between what I'm actually experiencing and some of what's out there. And so we just feel like that's the tool of the day. You want to to change things, you have to be entertaining to grab people's attention. And the fact is, 
only a subset of the population will watch a standard, you know, documentary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I completely agree with that, especially in this world of having these satire shows of like The Daily Show and John Oliver and so forth. I think it certainly resonates with the crowd and the audience that you're trying to get to. I'm so excited about this film project, you know, especially, you know, someone who's so personally entrenched uh, in this space myself. Can't wait for it to come out. And what's really interesting to me is, is sort of getting inside the head of Dave Chase. And and so obviously, you know, help me connect the dots here, right? So you know, what's the personal why behind the what? Is there something, you know, beyond just the need that we need to essentially affect change? And you've been innovating and developing companies in the space of healthcare. What's sort of your personal drive that made you really want to produce, you know, one, produce a film about, you know, the heist that's occurring in healthcare, and number two, actually get into the film industry yourself? Yeah, I would say that it's a combination. I mean, the most provocative thing I've said is we've gone to war for far less than what healthcare is doing to America. And so I do believe that. And I do believe I have some knowledge about, at a system level, the problems and the solutions. And then there is, I think, just my upbringing. You know, my folks are very community minded very giving. I mean, one of the amazing stories that was kind of formative for me was learning that when they were newlyweds, the IRS audited them because they didn't think somebody with that low income could give that much money. And so I've had a good example there to feel like I got to tackle it. And then in terms of, you know, getting in the film piece of it, I guess I just like being stupid again, you know, and like (laughs) learning new things. Um, And it took me a while to get this, but you know, somebody basically just said, "You know, this is just like a startup." I'm like, "Wait a second, you're exactly <laughs> right." This, you know, you have to pull together a world class team, and you have to tell a story to investors and bring a product out. And you know, I mean, it's not perfectly the same, but boy, it's a lot closer than I would have thought. And so, you know, part of building a world class team is, you know, I did software development a long time ago, but you know, with my last startup. You know, I had a great co-founder, and you know, he was the technical genius behind the team. And so, you know, the equivalent of that is, you know, a great storyteller, filmmaker who can take what I think I've got a big wonky hunk of marble, but I need to them have them chip away. You know, kind of Michelangelo chip away and and really turn it into a great piece of art. And so, you know, I'm fully cognizant of my limitations. And there's people who are incredibly talented at doing that. And so that kind of gave me, I guess, a little boost of confidence that it's not an impossible task. What's that process been like for you? I mean, how did you get up to speed in terms of how the film industry operates and and how do you navigate around, you know, finding and identifying the right team and the right talent and other folks to get involved and sort of create the support that you need to, to get a project like this off the ground? Yeah, it was a combination of just what any of us do when you go into a new realm and just reading up and the course is incredible resources on the internet and people you can talk to, you know, and being resourceful there. So that was a, a big part of it. And then, you know, the, when the original idea came to me and I just hope somebody else would run with it, I just put it out there in a blog post and figured I'd probably mm-hmm. just get, you know, 90% likely I'd just get crickets back. But I thought, well, what the heck, I'll put it out there. And lo and behold, people came back to me and it was kind of what I did with the startup is is you just want those arm racer you know arm raisers that have an aligned you know view of the world who want to help you or you know in the startup case maybe be a customer in this case be a collaborator and they're like oh did you know I worked with this you know Sundance winner did you know that my uncle is this famous guy in Hollywood did you know you know it's like you know you have no idea like these connections, but I think being willing to put yourself out there and, you know, I make no illusion of, <laughs> around my level of expertise and contacts and network, but people want to help. And if you kind of paint that picture and what's at stake and how it can both be, you know, it's a nice combination of something that is hugely important to our society, which we've talked about, but should be fun as hell you know, and that's a good combination that creates a magnetism. And so, you know, we did a crowdfund recently and there, make no mistake, there's a lot easier ways to raise money. That wasn't Mm -hmm. the primary objective. It was really, I look at it as, 
this metaphor of ripples in the pond. And so that rock or people like you and me and, and folks we know who really want to drive change. And that first ripple out was really the focus of the crowd fund, the folks who are forward looking nurses, doctors, benefits, professionals, business, you know, and so on that want to be a part of this. And then when the next phase of marketing, which is really what the crowd fund was all about is that next ripple out folks who aren't in the industry, but have a stake in it, you know, business mm-hmm. owners, union leaders, faith-based leaders, and so on. And so bit by bit, you know, you, you work up this, this broad-based movement. And, you know, the thing that if I have one unique skill, I guess it would be building great virtual teams as well as core teams. And so people have been very, very helpful and very forthcoming. And so it's, it's not been too difficult. Of course, I'm sure I've got a bunch more blind spots that are going to get uncovered before too long, but so far so good. Yeah. And just so for folks listening, I mean, that crowdfunding campaign was, was super successful. In fact, I think you surpassed almost every metric that you had set out in terms of setting goals for, for that campaign. You know, it's always been fascinating to me, Dave, is you have an incredible way of actually rallying a community around. And I can't think of a better person to actually be spearheading this ambitious project than someone like you, because you know, I've been following your blog posts and and articles that you've been publishing around, and you certainly know how to get a community together and to react and, and get them excited about something. It stems through from your initial approach to seeding the idea with your followers and, and those that surround you to the crowdfunding campaign, and certainly the next level and the next stage is probably going to be even bigger and grander than anything we've ever seen. When can we expect the release of this movie? Where are you in the process of this? We're still relatively early. You know, we're, you know, I'd use a, a software term, we're, we're feature driven, not date driven. Mm-hmm. So when we get the right thing together, I mean, if, if every star aligned, you know, a year from now, you know, we would have something together that would be, you know, getting ready to hit film festivals and all of that. But uh, like I said, we're all about the final product and, you know, the good implication, maybe the downside of the good news of other oh, folks getting involved at very high levels, there'll be other people and, and they'll have thoughts around, you know, where to take it creatively as well as distribution and all that. So what we're doing in the meantime is, you know, we've got the website where we're kind of a confessional, you know, for both, you know, regular people as well as doctors and nurses of what's going on. And so we're going to be sharing these stories we're kicking around ideas of like little mini, you know, film contests where they can take some of the raw materials we have. And, and of course, most of the stories that we have won't get into the film, but it's, it's really to build towards that film. Cause it's, if it's just a moment in time film, it's not going to change something that's as intractable as healthcare. So that's where, you know, we'll have stuff coming out, you know, over the next, six, 12 months for sure that are a combination of text and and visual, you know, and video stories. Uh, And then hopefully the film will be shortly behind, but, you know, we're going to take our time to do it right there. At this point in time, can you mention who you've gotten involved with the project? I know you've got, uh, I've seen some public postings of some partnership and workings with ZDog MD, Zubin Demania. Yep. Um, Any others that you've synced up with that, you know, that are assisting in this project for you, with you? Yeah, I mean, different levels. I mean, I can give a couple little bits. So yeah, Dr. Zubin Damania, who's a creative genius. He's been great sounding board. Jonathan Bush, who's the CEO of Athena Health and very creative, colorful guy. He is supporting it financially as well as some other folks out there. You know, in terms of the creative development process, we've had involvement from Megan O'Hara and Nick McKinney, who've come out of the kind of originally Michael Moore world and worked like Bowling for Columbine and Sicko. And then Nick worked with The Daily Show and Morgan Spurlock. So they've been providing some consultative help. But there's a there's definitely some others that we can't really go into yet because mm-hmm. um, yeah. they're not public about it, but uh, really excited about that. And you know th- the way these films often work is you have a you know a building team and people who play pivotal roles at particular points in time and so we're continuing to sort of plow through that love it love it can't wait it cannot come fast enough before the release of this but you know i like to sort of as a fascinating conversation dave i love to you know i ask all of my guests sort of a series of rapid fire 
Mad Lib open questions or sort of comments where you just sort of fill in the blank. And this is just meant to be very spontaneous. So I've just got five laid out here for you. If you're uh, okay, we'll go ahead and proceed with those. Yeah, happy to. All right. So the first one is the best piece of advice I ever received was? You know, early in my career, I had a manager who said, find gaps and fill them. And I think that was really an aha moment for me. And I mean, even the film we just were talking about, that was something because I think you, at least me, I went into the adult world thinking that the adults had it all figured out and you realize they're just <laughs> as screwed up, if not more than kids. And there are lots of gaps. So that was really a, a key one for me. Okay, great. Yeah, that's great advice. Second one, I am most curious about... Really how you successfully bring together folks who come from different places, very different places, sort of philosophically and background, but kind of strip away some of that to really get at what motivates them and ultimately what would motivate them to change and you know work in collaboration with folks who they may not think about working with before. That's great. I love that. It's like even part of the mission of what we do here at Unusual is trying to uh, bring together people with divergent and different perspectives to see sort of what kind of magic can be created out of that. So I love that uh, sense of curiosity there. Next one, now you're, you, you love writing and you're an amazing author. Maybe eventually you get around to this, but if you had to write a book about yourself, an autobiography in a sense, the title of the book would be? I would say something like The Curious Congenital Optimist. <laughs> All right. Explain. <laughs> I'm just, I believe that the moment you stop learning, you start dying. And I've just always been curious. I love Curious George as a kid and mm -hmm. I'm just very curious. And then the congenital optimist, I mean, I think it's basically a job requirement for anybody who does startups. I just see opportunity in even pretty difficult situations and, you know, basically believe that vast, vast, vast majority of people are well-intended. And that's certainly true in healthcare, even folks in, in some of the segments of the industry that will get critiques. I mean, yeah, here and there, there's some idiot like Martin Shkreli. But man, in my experience, virtually everybody really went in into it the right reasons yeah. and wants to do it. And so it's it's how you bring them on board drives me, I guess. Yeah, makes good sense. Uh, so next one, if you could invite three people over for dinner, dead or alive, or I guess in, in your case, we can even open it up to cartoon caricatures if you want to bring in Curious <laughs> George, who would you invite and what would you talk about? I would say there's one as a family connection, my, call him Gramps, my mom's dad, who died when I was so young, I, I didn't remember him, but he was really good at bringing people together. And I've heard some, you know, my relatives say that, I remind them of him. And mm -hmm. then the non-family members would be um, Mandela and Lincoln. And I think it's it's kind of around a similar thing we were talking about. Just I would love to hear their words of wisdom, how to bring to you know people together coming from really different frames of reference, be able to put aside, you know, in the case of uh, certainly Mandela, um, some pretty horrific things that had happened in the past to be able to move forward and like how you do that at, at sort of every level. Uh, I think that would be a really uh, fascinating conversation. Yeah, definitely fascinating choices. Love them. All right. Last one for you. Last fill in the blank here. So of course on this podcast, we like to celebrate what makes us different and unique. So how would you fill in this last statement here? I'm unusual because. I think it's cause I, I think in ecosystems and industry ecosystems and like to, you know, believe I'm pretty good at uh, shifting ecosystems. So I would say that probably would be the thing that I'm probably unusual, I guess. And at least that's what people tell me because I take a pretty broad ecosystem level way of looking at problems. Yep. Certainly we'll agree with that. That certainly does make you unique and different. You've got sort of a nice you know, bird's eye view in terms of how everything connects together and, and certainly one to bring it together in, in this film project that you're putting together. So for, you know, I just need to thank you. It was, it was wonderful having you on the show, Dave. It's always a delight speaking to you. Before we wrap up here though, if somebody wanted to learn more about you or how they can get involved with, you know, the big heist or the health Rosetta project or anything else that you're working on, how, where, where would you direct them to go? Well, probably the 
bigheistmovie.com and healthrosetta.org or just I'm Chase Dave on just about everything, whether it's LinkedIn or Twitter or whatever. So if you put in whatever the site is slash Chase Dave, you'll probably find me there. So I'm pretty easy to find. I'm I'm not the uh, Sopranos producer. I'm not David Chase. I think I, I crush him on Google. So you know he's not too active on the internet. So <laughs> right. um, it's probably me if you Google Dave Chase. Okay, great. Yeah. And you're just certainly not difficult to chase down. So I had to <laughs> sort of pull in the pun there. So lots of yeah. different places to find you on the interwebs. And again, thank you for being on the show, Dave. Hi again, it's me, Dr. G. If you are still listening, I'm hoping it's because you enjoyed this podcast. If you would like to hear future episodes, you could really help me out by subscribing to the That's Unusual podcast on iTunes and leaving a review. It goes a long way in helping me get the word out from avid listeners like you. As a thank you, I will be selecting one new reviewer each week at random for a free private 15-minute phone conversation where you can ask me anything and get professional advice on your career or business to help you stand out and make a difference. Also, if you want to be notified of any future episodes, please visit thatsunusualpodcast.com and sign up to receive updates on new episode releases. Until next time, remember to always think unusual.